it seemed like the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 2 had really given uh, the Jewish believers in Christ, at least some of them, a real stern talking to. No one can call you on the carpet like your own, right? That, that look that your mama gives you, you know that she's serious. And so the Apostle Paul was not hating on the Jewish people as a Jewish man who understood the history and the beauty of his people, and, and that's his family, right? That's his community, that's his people, but he's calling them to a higher place. He's calling them to love all peoples and to do life with all peoples. And saying that some of what we've been doing, some of our religious practices, have become legalistic, and it's creating this power dynamic where there's those who have a knowledge of faith in God and those that don't. Those who are righteous, so to speak, and those who are not. And so the Apostle Paul uh, kind of says, brother, this cannot be this way, right? We've got to address some things. But watch what he does in this letter, verse 1. What advantage then is there in being a Jew, or what value is there in circumcision? He comes to this conclusion much in every way. First of all, the Jews have been entrusted with the very words of God. And so we'll see later in the book of Romans more about how the Jewish people are God's precious and chosen people. He goes on to say, what if some were unfaithful with their unfaithfulness? Will their unfaithfulness nullify God's faithfulness? Not at all. Let God be true and every human being a liar, as it is written, so that you may be proved right when you speak and prevail when you judge. But if our unrighteousness brings out God's righteousness more clearly, what shall we say? That God is in, unjust in bringing his wrath on us? I am using a human argument. Certainly not. If that were so, how could God judge the world? Someone might argue if my falsehood enhances God's truthfulness and so increase his glory, why am I still condemned as a sinner? Well, now that's a good question. As a youth, I didn't always think clearly. Can anyone relate to that today? <laughs> and we went on a missions trip to Akron, Ohio. And we had uh, just a really neat experience. We were inviting uh, the neighborhood around the church that we served to be a part of a, just a really fun event. Uh, they... They had, it was like a fair style experience, you know, where the community could just have fun together. And so our team came and we prayer walked, we knocked on doors, we handed out invite cards. But then in the evenings when we weren't engaged in ministry, we just have fun, right? And, and you just got those great moments with a youth group laughing with your friends. Well, in the host home we were staying in, in that neighborhood when we would drive through, we noticed a, a statue of a goose in the front yard of a house. But what was really striking about this goose is on different days that we would drive by, the goose would be dressed differently. <laughs> and the sweet woman, depending on the weather, would change the outfit of the goose, right? And so, you know, is it? 16, 17-year-old group of boys loaded in the car, right? We noticed that. And so I don't know who the genius was, but they thought, wouldn't it be fun if we took that goose? So there in the cloak of night, I've got the image just in my brain. I was one of those... Um, in it, but not really in it, right? So, like, we pull up our car down the street, several houses down, and, you know, I'm not going to be the one going in the yard. You hear me? I'm not going to be the one grabbing the goose. And so I still have this image in my mind. I'm all nervous waiting at the car, and here comes 
two of my friends, and they've got a hold of this goose, but they underestimated how heavy a concrete <laughs> goose statue is. And they are walking down the middle of the street, holding it like this, wobbling, you know, coming. And of course, we put that thing in the trunk and shut the door. It was the greatest kidnapping of all time. And we just laughed and had a good old time. And as we left Akron, Ohio, without our youth pastor knowing, we loaded that thing up in our van, right, and shut the door. And there it proudly stood stood on the stage of our youth group. We were not thinking clearly. (laughs) Our feelings trump common sense. Whether it's a moment like that where you're excited about doing something devious, you just get this feeling that comes over you, this thought, you know, and oh boy, the air was so thick with excitement, it was like, oh, this is going to be great, right? Or when our feelings are at a low, when we're down and out, when we're depressed, when we're discouraged, when life doesn't work out like we want it to work out, We stop thinking clearly. And even though we may have it in our hearts to do what is right, to be righteous before God, we make decisions that are going to cause challenges in our life. And so here in Romans chapter 3, the Apostle Paul says it so clearly, someone might argue if my falsehood enhances God's truthfulness and so increases glory, why am I still condemned as a sinner? This person has lost their common sense, right? In other words, why can't I just do whatever I want to do? Because let's be honest, doing what's right is hard. Doing what's right is hard. Because doing what's right is requires energy and effort on our part. In fact, I I was thinking about it this week. There is a weightiness to doing what's right. And it's weighty because there's a a cost to be paid, a sacrifice. You're, You're sacrificing the immediate. The cost is in that moment when you're wanting to do that thing that you know you shouldn't do, it's contrary to God's word, you feel like doing it. And in those feelings, our common sense gets overridden and we just want to go for it. And so the weightiness is is in that moment denying the flesh and saying, I'm going to choose a different path. There's a cost to my immediate gratification. All of us know in the story I just shared, what should I have done? I should have been like, it's not right to take a goose, and you shouldn't do that, right? (laughs) There is a weightiness to doing what's right. That would have cost me something in the immediate. They would have said, oh, come on, you know, whatever. (laughs) But guess what? If I would have stood up, shared those comments, they would have given me a hard time for a couple minutes, and then it would have been over. It would have been over. And the beauty of living a righteous life, the fruit, the benefit of doing what's right, far outweighs the weightiness of the moment. God's word is true. What we uh, sow is what we reap. And it's worth the hard work of digging in the ground, right, to cultivate something good in your life. Dare to do what's right. Dare to push through those moments. Dare to choose God's path. I love that the word of God says that when we're facing temptation, God will provide a way of escape for us. Have you ever had the presence of mind in a moment of temptation to pray, Lord, I'm going to make the wrong decision. I already know it. (laughs) Show me the way of escape. 
Holy Spirit, show me the way of escape. Give me a different path. And when he does, awesome things happen. The Apostle Paul continues in Romans chapter 3, and, and he gets into this section where he talks about there's no one righteous, not even one. There's no one who understands. There's no one who seeks God. All have turned away. They have altogether become worthless. Their throats are open graves. Their tongues practice deceit. Their, the poison of vipers is on their lips. The mouths are full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Ruin and misery mark their ways, and the way of peace they do not know. There is no fear of God before their eyes. It says in verse 20, Therefore, no one will be declared righteous in God's sight by the works of the law. This is what I want to draw out. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of our sin. How do we know what's right and wrong? Well, there's kind of two things. There's this, I think, innate quality that God has given all of us to just know this probably isn't right. I I didn't need to see that night a sign in the yard that said, stealing the concrete goose is wrong, right? (laughs) I I had that internal understanding and yet God goes a step further not only does he give us that innate quality to know what's right and wrong and the Holy Spirit even in moments to encourage us around what's right and wrong but he gives us his word and specifically the Old Testament law where God had revealed himself to his people is a beautiful example of here's what's right and here's what's wrong. What's significant about the Jewish people is their very culture, the cultural identity that they have was shaped by God himself as they did their best to follow the law. The practices that we read, I know sometimes it's hard to read the Old Testament and grab all of it, but the practices that God lays out, they're really beautiful. And they invite people to live a holy life, to live a righteous life, to love their neighbor as their self. And the word breaks that down in practical ways. And do, do not envy your neighbor, right? And do not commit adultery. And, and there's a lot about um, not being corrupt and, and, and being fair and using the the right weights and measures, right? And how we should approach court cases and loving, loving those who are, uh, who are immigrants in our community. And the Old Testament talks about all of these things. But what the people of God, the conclusion they came to is they couldn't get it all right. On their own, they couldn't make right decisions time and time again, and so they struggled to keep their end of the covenant to follow this Old Testament law. It seemed too weighty for them. So the Apostle Paul does a beautiful job of just saying, the Old Testament law really helps people understand that they're sinners, that they can't do it. When I read this section there's no one righteous not even one their throats are open graves and we go through the list it kind of can feel like well thanks a lot god (laughs) you created me didn't you if you don't want me doing this stuff why did you give me a desire for this stuff it kind of loops back up into this human arguments that we can make right But God gave us free will. And he's given us a mirror through the law to look at ourselves and to see our sinfulness. It's not just about following some standards or rules that he's laid out for us to follow. Unrighteous pleasure causes pain. Listen, as much joy as we had in our hearts... When we saw that concrete goose sitting on that stage, there was some 
sweet woman in Akron who is heartbroken. Listen, if you're dressing a goose up, you love it. And we had stolen something that wasn't ours. And for our own pleasure, we caused someone else pain. Sin causes pain. It's painful to others. You know, it's like, you know, what is this deal? Gossip is sin? Come on, God. I just want to hear what's going on, right? And share some stuff. But we're, we're getting into people's business. We're tearing others down. Sometimes we have this myth um, that all sin is the same. It's not. The, the understanding biblically of that is all sin makes us sinners. There's no one righteous, not even one. Doesn't mean that you're a murderer, right? Doesn't mean that you're abusing people. But all sin does make us sinners. And so those things like gossip and hatred that we feel in our hearts and and things like drunkenness and things that we think, oh, I'm just doing this. It's not affecting anybody. It is affecting others. It is causing pain. It's causing pain in family members and coworkers and friends. It's causing pain in your own life and it's causing pain to God. His heart grieves when his children are hurting. So it's out of love that God has given us the law. It's out of love that the Old Testament gives us an understanding of sin. And the instruction that we have in the the word of God, you know, dig into it, read it, understand it, wrestle with it. I love the rabbinical model, this this model in in Jewish culture is they would read the word and then they would dialogue about it and ask questions and what about this and what about that and and if there's something listed in in the New Testament, wrestle with it. Why is this a sin? Why is this harmful? Why does God not want me to do this? Listen, if we all come up with our own list, of what is sin and evil and corrupt, if we decide righteousness in our own eyes, we've got a lot of trouble, don't we? And if we rely on society, the consensus of society in any given moment to define righteousness, we've got challenges as well. There is a general sense of what is right in society today. People may or may not agree with all of that, right? But if we were to go to different places in the world, different people groups, if we could travel through time, that, that kind of sense, that conscious of society is going to be a little bit different, right? So we've got to rely on the word of God. That's our standard. So I love that in this, laced throughout Romans chapter 3, laced throughout Romans chapter 2, throughout the whole book, the Apostle Paul isn't just trying to say, you are bad people. (laughs) He's talking about the disease so that we can be excited about the cure. He's given us a, a dose of reality, right, to help us understand our need and the opportunity. So he says in verse 25, God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. He did this to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance or patience, he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. Listen, we sometimes only focus on the the aspect of God's holiness and righteousness as he doesn't have sin. 
but the Apostle Paul just draws out this beautiful picture of God in his righteousness. He is patient with us. He's doing what's right and giving us an opportunity even in our sin, even in our sinfulness, even in the sinfulness of generations past, he sent a Savior, and his name is Jesus. It even says later in the New Testament that, that God doesn't want anyone to perish. He wants all to come to repentance. So this is a season of grace. This is a se- season of patience. This is a season of kindness. God's kindness leads us to repentance. He did it to demonstrate his righteousness at the present time, so as to be just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. Church, it's never too late to do what's right. It's never too late to do what's right. It took us a couple weeks. I don't know how we worked it out, but someone was driving up to northern Ohio and stuck that goose in their trunk. I hope she got it back. But what, a, what really would have been right is if we would have delivered it ourselves. With a new outfit. Cincinnati Reds outfit or something. Because, yeah, it's nice to receive something back that's been taken from you, but there's restoration where where there's repentance. And I'm sure it would have made a great deal to that woman if, if we would have stood there in our baggy clothes as teenage boys and said to her, this wasn't right, we're sorry. We're sorry this caused you pain. Every day is a new day to make things right with God. Even though this righteous law that he's given us, his word, that more than anything reminds us that we're human and frail and sinful. It leads us to a Savior. A Savior that didn't come to condemn us, but to save us.